good. Okay, I'm appreciative that there's still people here. <laughs> uh, it's been a great pleasure to be giving these lectures. So, this will be a slightly different flavor. Ramana Jan will only enter in the last slide. <laughs> of course, he was interested in this too. So, this lecture has a little philosophical aspect to it because I'm going to, in my youth, if you may, if I was making an estimate, I would always insist it has to have a rate, it has to be effective. Otherwise, what really, what are you doing really? However, I'm especially going to allow the freedom not to put rates in, formula in the formulation of this. And I think it'll be clear why by the end, because we'll be using certain theorems like that of Ratner, which are not effective. Okay, so I'm going to discuss, <coughs> is this thing working? be good to point. Anyway, um, I think I just, you just have to switch it on. I don't know how. Uh, you know, no, it's somewhere, somewhere putting it on. I guess. Well. Okay, so the Mobius function, I'll just remind you what it is, so you really don't need to have much prerequisites for this lecture until the end. Mu of n, it's minus 1 to the number of prime factors that n has, if the number has a distinct prime factors, and otherwise it's zero. It's a very, here it has the, uh, what it looks like, if mu of 1 is 1, mu of, uh, mu of 2 is minus 1, etc. You can compute it. And mankind has looked at the sequence, many people have commented, written, it's still one of the most uh, subtle and difficult sequences to understand. Do these plus ones and minus ones come down at random? Do the zeros, how do they fill in over there? Why are we so interested in this? <coughs> Formally, the Riemann zeta function is product p to the one, one minus p to the minus s to the minus one. So one over the Riemann zeta function is this product over here, which if you then multiply this Euler product and collect terms, it will define for you the Mobius function. So if one over the Riemann zeta function has coefficients which are the Mobius sequence, then by simple complex analysis, questions about where zeta has zeros, the poles of one over zeta, are clearly controlled by the cancellation in mu of n. And this is very familiar. So if you sum n up to n of mu of n and ask how much cancellation is in that sum, uh, Basically, you're looking at the prime number theorem or the Riemann hypothesis immediately. So if you want to explain some, to someone what the Riemann hypothesis is without any information like complex functions, you can state it in terms of the Mobius function. And people do. So it's a great achievement. Mankind has achieved the following fact, that if you sum n up to n of mu of n and you divide by n, so this little o n, if you divide by n, you'll go to zero. The fact that some mu of n, n up to n, capital N, is little o of n is uh, what, probably the best thing we know about this function. It's tautolog not it's elementarily equivalent to the prime number theorem. The prime number theorem is a very famous theorem. It's there's even an elementary proof. I would like to suggest there's got to be an ergodic proof, but nobody's ever found that. Though maybe somebody will be inspired after this lecture. So. Even that little piece of information that this is smaller than the, the trivial upper bound of the division by n is 1, the fact that it goes to 0 is the prime number theorem. It's equivalent to the prime number theorem. The famous Riemann hypothesis is equivalent to the statement that you have square root cancellation in that sum, which is what you would expect if the mu n's were random. So this lecture is about the randomness in the Mobius function, and this equivalence to Riemann hypothesis is very familiar and very standard and it's not what I want to talk about. And I will not, this talk is not about the Riemann hypothesis. And by the way, this is not an approach to the Riemann hypothesis, this is just an equivalence. If you think that you're going to just estimate this series and prove Riemann, uh, 
you're in for, I think, a rough time. <laughs> uh, it, but it is a way, as I said, of formulating the Riemann hypothesis for someone who's not, never heard of the Riemann zeta function. And it is a uh, evidence or some suggestion that Mobius is random. So there, 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 there are millions of papers written about the randomness of Mobius in connection with this cancellation. Uh, you can make it very graphic. Suppose I'm a drunkard walking on the integer lattice and I'm, uh, don't flip a coin at each end and move to the right or to the left with probability a half, but rather I look at the nth step at what Mobius is. And if Mobius is one, I move to the right. If it's minus one, I move to the left. And if it's zero, I stick. After a long walk, where will I be? How far from the origin? Well, the Riemann hypothesis says about square root n away from the origin, which is what you would expect if you were a drunkard. So it is saying, another way of saying it is the, if you, uh, well, okay. Now, there's an old heuristic that we use in, especially in the top subject of what's called analytic number theory, and if you look in the book of Ivanich and Kowalski, this is a beautiful up-to-date book on many of the standard methods in modern analytic number theory. They call this the Mobius randomness law. And what this says is that whenever you see the series mu of n, so it's a heuristic, and it's never given a wrong prediction, so it's very reliable, and it predicts twin primes, it predicts exotic things. Whenever you see a sum of mu of n against a function xi of n, and xi of n is here supposed to be bounded. If xi of n is getting big or small, it would be very different. So you should just be thinking of xi n is a bounded function. Xi, if xi is 1, we in this situation, but give yourself a function xi of n there, then you will have cancellation in the sum. And I'm not going to give a rate here. So this is what I'm saying. I, I'm not, this is the first step in this analysis, and I'm just going to put little o of n. So if you were to use this as a predictor of answers to things, you may want to put some speed here, log to a power maybe. But I stick to this. And the principle says that Mobius will cancel against anything that it doesn't know about. So they don't make it precise. Nobody knows how to make this precise. I will make it precise today for you, this principle. But what, say, Ivanitz, I asked him, what does this mean? He says, you give me the Xi, I'll tell you whether it's supposed to cancel. I'll sniff Xi. <laughs> so if Xi, of course, is Mobius itself, it won't cancel. But if Xi doesn't know about Mobius, then it will cancel. That's sort of the philosophy. And so the, the, the Mobius is sufficiently random, it will overcome any other sequence which is sort of doesn't know about it. Well, the better way to start thinking about this is maybe Xi's of low complexity, mu's of high, very random, then it'll cancel. And that's the direction I want to go. I want to make a definition of what reasonable means here. And, I, and uh, I'll explain that much of what we've been doing for many years is exactly this. So I, why is this Mobius principle there? Why is it in Ivanich and Kowalski's book? Precisely because of its predictability power. So if you ever have a sequence and you want to see how many primes there are, you, there's a simple formula that the counting function of primes, lambda of n, which is log p if n is a prime power and zero otherwise, is written as the sum d divides n mu of d log d. That's sort of the basis of any sieve of any method to count primes. So if you want to sum lambda of n, which is counting prime powers with weight log is, is, about, is no worse than counting primes themselves. So if you want to count, sum lambda of n against some function, Again, C of n, you could write it as a sum which is a double sum in which Mobius appears. And then you switch orders, and this is how you use this as a predictor of answers. So that's the background, and I want to try and make sense of this Mobius randomness principle. I have for many years thought maybe the right notion, but I quickly dismissed it for the reason I'm about to tell you, maybe the right notion is computational complexity. And I know that's a very big subject in this country. There many of the top computational complexities in the world, complexity people in the world, are Indian from, or Indian origin. So it's a natural thing. You might say maybe Mobius should cancel against any function which it takes. Suppose I give you a function C. So this would say, suppose I'm in the class P. That means I can compute C of n in polynomial of log n 
steps. In other words, in polynomial of the number of digits, that's the information in an integer n. Suppose I give you a sequence which is polynomial. We know it's polynomial, so you can compute it quickly. Maybe then Mobius will have to cancel it against it. Remember, my C is always bounded. Well, they may, I think there may be people who believe this, but I certainly don't believe this because I don't believe that factoring is hard. There's no evidence that factoring is hard. This is just dogma. This is just because people want you to believe that RSA is secure. So it's a big problem is factoring in P. Testing primality is in P. This is a great theorem of Agrawal, Kayal, and Saxana, coming from this country. Uh, but factoring, nobody has a good, nobody knows. Maybe the National Security Agency knows how to factor quickly, but they're not going to tell us. So there's no evidence it's hard. There's no theoretical evidence it's hard. And I personally think that maybe one day from some one of these in institutes, uh, technology institutes, a young guy will just give us an algorithm to factor quickly, and that will certainly cause a lot of noise. But there's no, we're asking you what's true in principle. So you have to have some beliefs, and my belief is factoring is easy. And if factoring is easy, then you can compute mu quickly. So if mu is in P, then certainly it's not true that you're going to say that mu cancels against C when C is in P. So it's not the right notion as far as I'm concerned. And that the reason I'm dismissing it is purely a belief. Let me give a problem here, which I, you can come awfully close to doing, but I still have not been able to do it. And I think it's a very fundamental question. If I gave you a very large number n, and I put a gun to your head, and I said, you've got 24 hours, and you've got to tell me whether mu of n is plus 1 or minus 1. Zero, you'll see, is much easier to determine. Would you just flip a coin and then take your, would you just freeze? Or would you do some frantic computations and then increase your chances of getting it right? In other words, can you give me a function in P, that's your 24 hours of computation, such that mu of n times C of n correlates, so, can, so this is a problem. Construct a function in P, that means for each value n I can compute C of n in polynomial time, which correlates with mu. So I'm telling you, I believe mu is computable in polynomial time, so that would do it. But I'm not even in, you just need to make for me a function which most of the time guesses mu, positive proportion of the time. I don't know, take an elliptic curve, look at the sign of a functional equation, do something clever, put in Birchman and Dyer, throw in whatever you want. But in the end, you must increase your odds of getting, it doesn't have to work all the time. It's a great challenge. Anyway, I don't know how to do that. If you do that, that would uh, theoretically dismiss the complexity class as being the right notion immediately. So I'm going to dismiss that and now I turn to a different way which I picked up and uh, based on many things as you'll see. I want to define the complexity of the sequence C using dynamical systems. This is a philosophy that certainly was championed by Furstenberg over many, many years and in fact it was on reading a few of his papers that this whole idea uh, occurred. Uh, so let me explain this a little bit because it's a very nice idea and it's the ideas which led him to his proof of the Samaretti theorem. So you start off with a sequence C of n and I want to say whether it's co how complicated it is. It's a different notion of complexity. And the idea is going to be that, well, suppose I have a dynamical system and this sequence C of n is an observable in that system. In other words, so a dynamical system here will be something very abstract and simple. It's a compact, say, metric space, topological space, and a continuous map from x to x. All right, so that's the, uh, it's topological dynamics. It's, it's important that it's topological in everything I'm doing here. The minute I put in a measure and randomize everything, everything I'll say will become trivial, as I'll explain. So x is a compact metric space, t is a continuous map, an observable in this dynamics is simply there's a point x in the space, a continuous function on the space. So I have a starting point x, a continuous function which is observable, and I look at the values that I see, c of n is f of t to the nx. So that gives me, f is bounded of course, so it'll give me a bounded sequence. And I want to say c of n is as complicated or not complicated depending on whether the dynamics, the dynamical system is complicated or not. So this is, an, uh, this is an observable sequence in a dynamical system. Yeah, it's realized in, in F. In, uh, no, it's realized 
No, 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 there's no P. P was polynomial time. What's P? F is a dynamical system. This sequence, I repeat, the sequence is realized in a dynamics if there's a point in the system and a continuous function such that this is the observation times of that. All right. So the idea is to measure the comp complexity of a sequence by the complexity of the simplest dynamical system in which you can realize it. So if the sequence is the constant sequence, <laughs> which is the only thing we know Mobius against right now, uh, then that would be reachieved in the dynamical system, which is a point. And the, only, and the map, it's an identity map. So that's certainly a simple sequence, and you can realize it. But you can, of course, realize the constant function in a very complicated system. So you don't, you, when you want to define the complexity of a sequence, you would want to define it as the complexity in the simplest system you can realize it in. And so it's better always to talk about the complexity of systems rather than of sequences, and I'll fix this up right now. Notice that just by abstract nonsense, you'll never, you don't lose any information by looking at um, this. You can realize any sequence, so any C of n, say the Cs take value 0, 1, can always be realized in the following dynamical system. You take 0, 1 to the n with a product topology, with a tick and off topology, that's a compact metric space. And you take an infinite sequence in the space and you shift it one to the left. That's a continuous map in this topological space. That's the standard shift. This is a very complicated system. It's got everything in it. That's what I'm telling you. And if you take the starting point to be the sequence that you, that you want to realize, then, and you observe the first coordinate, you'll just re realize the sequence in that system. So that system is the universal system. It's got everything. But if you want to find formally the simplest system in which you'll realize C of n, you would take the sequence C and you would take the closure of that in this topological space. That would be invariant and that's where you would realize the se sequence in its simplest possible system. But the, of course taking that closure is asking all the questions. <laughs> sort of tautological. Looks hopeless. You read Furstenberg and you say, well, he's converting Samaretti's theorem to dynamics. It's just language. But what has the Gothic theory got to offer you? It's got to offer you a grand pigeonhole principle, I would say. If you have a compact space, you have recurrence, you have to come back on yourself. It's, it captures information, and Furstenberg certainly convinced the world that this viewpoint, I mean, his proof of Samaretti is by far the most important. All the further developments are based on his ideas and the entrance of certain things called null manifolds, which I'll discuss in a second also. All right, so if I want to, so uh, t ergodic theorists know this very well. Just let me review this for the general audience. If I want to measure now the complexity of my sequence, I need to measure the complexity of the dynamical system. There are measure, many measures of dynamical system. There's chaos theory. There are many, many things. But there's one invariant which for a long time didn't look like the right invariant for this problem. And in fact, my colleague, he finally left to Israel, Elon Lindenstrauss, kept on telling me he's got counterexamples to what I'm about to state. But eventually, I'll show you, it was clear there are no counterexamples. So the right notion was just entropy. And that's beautiful because that's the first in most fundamental measure of the complexity of the system. So let me remind you what topological entropy is. We just have this dynamical system. So how do I define the topological entropy, which is the measure of the complexity of this transformation on a compact metric space? The entropy is, is simply the exponential growth rate of the number of orbits. Well, you tell me, wait a minute, there are infinitely many orbits. What does this mean? So what you do, the standard definition, the definition I'll give you right now is due to Bowen. You give yourself two parameters, epsilon and n. You sort of view you have a microscope of strength epsilon. And you look how many distinct orbits can you find, distinct of length n, epsilon distinct? Two orbits are considered to be distinct if in the first capital N steps, so I start at x and at y, and I take n steps, and suppose that at some moment I am epsilon apart. Then those two orbits are considered distinct. Now you... Com the definition of length of an object? I mean, I uh, no, no, the length, this number of steps. Number of steps. Yeah, and uh, when I measure epsilon, I, I assume it's a metric space. I'm not, I'm not getting into pathology. <laughs> you can, the definition can be done with topology only. This is due to Adler, somebody else, 1967, the definition of topological entropy. So you count 
the maximum, so for each epsilon and n, you count the maximum number of distinct orbits. It's finite by compactness. You take the log of that, you divide it by n, you take the limb sup as n goes to infinity, then you take the limb sup as epsilon goes to zero, that double limit. And it doesn't matter how you take that double limit, you get one number, and that's called h. And if it's positive, then there's an exponential number of distinct orbits, and if it's zero, the system's called deterministic. So that's the crudest measure of complexity. Entropy is the number of orbits growing exponentially or not. It's a bit reminiscent of P, polynomial time, was also a polynomial number of steps. But this is exponential versus, so it's a, is the growth rate exponential or not? Now, as you will see as we move along here, the notion of, we just have a to topological dynamical system and it's critical, and I want to point out where, why Gardic theory usually does nothing for number theory. It only does something for number theory if you know what happens to every orbit. If you have something called unique ergodicity or something like that. So I will want to understand what's happening relative to a measure. But the minute you throw in a measure, then you're doing probability theory, and we're going to use both these theories. So what Furstenberg, so firstly, I'm, Throughout, this is standard terminology, a dynamical system is deterministic. I'll explain this word because it's very important for me. It's called deterministic if the entropy is zero. That's just the definition. So the system is deterministic if the entropy is zero. Now a process is a top, for us, will be a topological dynamical system, XT, together with a measure new, probability measure on the con Borel measure on the topological space, which is invariant under T. There could be many invariant measures, but if I have a triple like that, I now have what's called an ergodic system, but in this paper, Fersenberg's calling it a process, while the first thing he called it flow. Nobody uses that notation anymore, right? I will. I like the paper so much, I'll stick to this old notation. Flow usually means continuous, right? But his, for, for him, a flow is a, is a discrete transformation. A process is clear, it's got a measure. So this is a process, is a triple now, where this is an invariant measure. Okay, and then you can define, so this is usually what people call an ergodic, uh, not an ergodic, a measure dynamical system. So before this topological entropy, the notion of the entropy of a dynamical system with an invariant measure was defined. This is one of the most important definitions in ergodic theory. It's due to Kolmogorov, it wasn't quite a few rough edges in his definition was fixed up by Sinai. It's called the kolmogorov sinai entropy of the dynamical system. I'll relate it to you in a second in a well-known way to the topological entropy. But this now depends on the measure. And it's defined by a similar thing, but not with this epsilon and n, but with uh, Shannon type P log P partition and a limb sub argument. So you should think of it as it's the exponential growth rate of the number of orbits where you use the weight, the measure mu to weight the counting. And here, the, 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 the notion of deterministic is the word deterministic. This is why it's called deterministic, because in this probabilistic world, it's very clearly the right notion, because a system which is zero Kolmogorov sinai entropy is really deterministic in that you can determine the past, the future from the past. That is, suppose I know C2, C3, I know the tail of, uh, I'm observing this, and suppose I know what C2, C3 are forever, then I know what C1 is with probability 1 with respect to nu. That's equivalent to being zero entropy. It's the same notion. So that word determinism is clearly there. Okay, so one of the big theorems I want to prove to you here is mu of n is not deterministic. The proving mu is random is very hard. <laughs> I'm going to give you some evidence that it's random. What does this mean? This means there is no zero entropy dynamical system in which mu can be observed. And by the way, if there were such a system, topological system, I would sell a lot of things for it because that system would have the Riemann hypothesis in it. You'd certainly be able to answer all the questions you want. If you have a zero entropy system, topological entropy zero, Every point, it's got, it's not almost every point something, so in the topological sense, then, and you could, so what is the system of zero entropy, an integrable system? 
Could you look at the sky and watch every time you look at that part of the sky and you watch some planetary motion and you look at N and each time you look there it's factoring uh, or it's telling you what mu of N is. Well, nobody would expect there's such an algorithm and this theorem says there isn't. There is no zero entropy system which could read mu. Okay, a much stronger form of this conjecture is that mu can't even be approximated by a deterministic sequence. And that's the main conjecture, and that's going to be the Mobius randomness principle. So let me say that mu is disjoint from a system. If it's disjoint from every observable in the system, and that simply means this question I started out with. So I'm going to say mu is disjoint from a dynamical system, topological dynamical system. If some, I should, I'm now I, I'm, I've got notes on this that you can find. I'll give references at the end. I want to add the word linear there to make some distinction between the theory of disjointness of Furstenberg, which I will get to, the full theory. So mu of n, xi of n, I've been asking the question, is summation mu of n, xi is always a bounded sequence. When is this cancelling? And I will now make a bit, uh, um, uh, the right way to view this from this point of view is I'll say mu is disjoint or orthogonal from the whole system F if for every observed sequence in F, this is true. So if the system F, I'll give you examples in a minute. And now I can tell you what the main conjecture is, which I think has many, many implications, including twin prime, but I haven't quite got that implication. Is mu is, this is the Mobius random law, randomness law stated formally and accurately. Mu is disjoint from any deterministic system. That is, any sequence which can be realized in a deterministic topological system should be orthogonal to mu. So this is... Uh, what Lyndon Strauss was telling me is definitely false <laughs> because he said to me, I haven't seen the worst zero entropy system because, of course, for me, zero entropy were a few homogeneous dynamical systems that our friend Dani here knows very well that you'll see in a minute. Uh, and he was absolutely right. I haven't seen the worst. And he was giving me worse and worse examples of dynamical systems which have zero entropy and look like they got positive entropy for long periods of time, but eventually... They actually have zero entropy. So I was quite nervous about this for a good year or two. But I want to emphasize I'm not asking for rates, and that's absolutely critical. So why would I believe this conjecture? Because there's another conjecture which maybe you don't believe, but once I formulate this, you're not going to doubt it, which implies that conjecture. There's a purely information theoretic combinatorial statement. So makes you quite comfortable, comfortable about the Mobius randomness conjecture, which was that mu is orthogonal to any uh, zero entropy uh, system. This is a conjecture of Chala, a well-known Indian mathematician, who it's formulated in his lovely little book. The only problem with the formulation of his conjecture in this book is there's a big misprint. It's got big O there, <laughs> not little O. <laughs> I, I can prove that. <laughs> Some n up to n is at most a constant times n. Uh, obviously, he didn't proofread it well enough. Uh, his book is called The Hilbert's Tenth Problem and it's 100 other problems, and this is problem 97 or something. And you might say, why is this a problem that you don't hear much about? In fact, very few people talk about it. The problem's so hard that nobody's ever made an iota of progress on it. And if a problem it's so hard that you can't say anything partial or any progress, it, it then sort of disappears out of existence. I mean, experts know about it. And it says, why am I looking, this is the obvious thing to do, why am I looking at Mobius correlating against other things? Why don't I see about Mobius correlating against itself? Why bring in the rest of the world? If I, and this says that if you understand what you're doing against yourself, you'll understand what you're doing against Xi. So what I'm saying, what he says is this. So may, suppose you take different numbers, distinct numbers here, and you sum n up to n of mu. So you're correlating mu with itself. The conjecture is it's little o of n. So if uh, there's just one factor here, that's the prime number theorem. If there are two factors here, this with a rate is pretty much a twin prime problem. Without a rate, it's a weaker statement. With R of those, it's more or less the k-tuple conjecture at the level of difficulty. And in fact, all techniques will sort of work with the same level. So we've never made any progress even with two factors there. And we, there's really nothing. Mankind hasn't worked out any means of correlating mu 
co a complicated sequence which depends on the factorization of a number, with itself shifted. And that's, nevertheless, there's no doubt that this is true. If, if, the, if the world were, so if there was a correlation here with mu n, mu n plus one, that would mean there's some conspiracy about whether n and n plus one have an odd or even number of prime factors. And I think we would know that. <laughs> so this is saying the world, it's the naive conjecture. There's no extra structure that we have, we don't know about. Okay, that's a very good question. I have never seen numerics on this. Um, this has fallen out of existence. Uh, you know about it, a few people, uh, I mean, some, but people who know about it don't do numerics. This should be experimented numerically. Uh, and it's, as far as I know, never been tested. But I, I certainly believe it. There's no reason, it seems very reasonable. It seems much, seems much more reasonable than saying that mu is dis disjoint from every zero <laughs> entropies and that sounds more dramatic. Anyway, Charlie and Plout's main conjecture is purely combinatorial. It's an information theoretic argument. So uh, I, I will return to Charlie maybe at the end, but uh, the reason I'm putting this other conjecture is we can make progress on it. And in fact, all progress is exactly this, as I'll explain to you now. Okay, and the, the, uh, if you had Chala with a rate, you would have twin prime, you'd have K tuple prime. So the philosophy, and it's very much Furstenberg's philosophy, is let's build up our problem backwards. Let's try to see how random Mobius is by building, how, how, how many, the more things you can show at Mobius is disjoint from, the more you've learned Mobius is random, and the more you've learned about actually primes. And this will be clear in a second. All right, so this was this point about no progress being made. However, there is progress, and I'm going to explain on uh, disjointness. It was never stated this way, you'll, but once I put it this way, you'll recognize it instantly. Ma most importantly, by Vinogradov. Vinogradov invented a very, very beautiful tool, which I'll review in a second. His method of bilinear sums. So the main way to pr it's how he proved every odd number is a sum of three primes. It's a very major breakthrough. And his technique, as I will explain, is purely dynamical. It's got to do with joinings of dynamics. And it, it's made for dynamics. All right. Now, the, so the, the main conjecture is we disjoint from every zero entropy system. Are we disjoint from a point? Yes, that was, I've repeated, just that was how I started. That's no more, no less than the prime number theorem. Are we disjoint from a dynamical system that's finite? Yes, that's the Riclay's theorem in prime of arithmetic primes in arithmetic progression. Are we disjoined from the simplest zero entropy system in the world, rotation of a circle? The rotation of a circle by an irrational alpha is a dynamical system which is zero entropy. It's a homogeneous, it's the simplest of all zero entropy systems. The answer is that's deep. Well, so are those, by the way. <laughs> each, each time you prove a disjointness, I'm telling you, 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 there's a big theorem that comes with it, prime number theorem. Dirichlet's theorem, Vinogradov's major breakthrough. This is, was the key breakthrough of Vinogradov with quantitative version to prove that every odd number is a sum of three primes. The most important thing he did that Hardy and Littlewood didn't was to give an estimate which is saying that mu of n, he didn't do mu, he was summing on primes, he had rates, but uh, what amounts to is summation mu of n e to the two pi i n x cancels is little o of n, I'm not putting in rates right now. And he invented a method to do that for an irrational alpha. But that's no more, no less than the disjointness of Mobius against any Kronecker flow. That's, that's what a torus rotation is. And these are the most basic zero entropy things. I'll return to his method in a second, but that's bilinear form. Uh, how are we doing yet? Okay, now we get to modern times, so it gets handwriting. <laughs> uh, actually, one of the motivations of doing this work was a remarkable piece of work by Green and Tao using Furstenberg's ideas uh, and Gower's ideas in their proof of Semiretti to study some problems in primes. Now, most people know their work as they prove that there are arbitrary long progressions in primes, which is a, what Semiretti's theorem says for sets of positive density. So that's a purely combinatorial statement. But in fact, since then, they have proved much more striking theorems. The most striking recent one, which I'll remind you in a second, 
is joined with Ziegler. And it's a statement about solving linear equations in primes. It's a complete generalization of Vinogradov. It says you can solve a system of uh, linear equations inhomogeneous, so there's, there's, there's no Samaretti an analog, there's no combinatorial analog, of linear equations in primes, as long as the number of equations is two less than the number of variables and there's no local obstruction. So we, they've generalized, that's exactly, more, no more, no less than what, the, what they've done. They have generalized Vinogradov to a system. Now in linear algebra, so, so the rank needs to be two or more. Vinogradov's theorem is that any linear equation in one variable, uh, in three variables, that's for the sum of three primes. It's one equation in three variables. Can be solved in primes. I mean, he states, he, he was stating in terms of Goldbach, but the real, his method gives that if you have the equation A1X1 plus A2X2 plus A3X3 equals B. The X's are variables. Can you solve for X1, X2, X3 prime? Well, if there's no obvious congruence obstruction, then you can always find primes which infinitely many primes, in fact, there's a risky dense set of primes which solve that. The set of x1, x2, three, x3 primes. And the breakthrough of Vinogradov was to show that Mobius is disjoint from rotations. Well, how about, what, what's their ingredient? So the big new ingredient is to use the ideas of Furstenberg in his proof of Samaretti and also versions that are more quantitative of Gower's. But the most important thing that enters is a null manifold. So you don't just need to know rotations against a circle, which Vinogradov needed to do one equation. You need to know to do several equations. So if you try to use the circle method directly on a simultaneous equations, you come to a torus and you, you need many variables. Circle method is very inefficient when it comes to simultaneous equations. But for simultaneous linear equations, this uh, Furstenberg theory brings in no manifolds out of nowhere. He brought that into the game. And so in the series of papers which achieved what I was just telling you, uh, Green and Tau needed to generalize the Vinogradov theorem of disjointness. They weren't calling it that, but that's what they were doing. The disjointness of Mobius against a null sequence. So the next most complicated dynamical system of zero entropy after the rotations of circles or, or compact rotations of groups, of abelian groups, are things called... Uh, high, uh, null manifold sequences. So the dynamics is I have a null manifold. It's no more really complicated than the Heisenberg manifold. So you look at N, which is 1 X, Y, Z, the upper triangular where X, Y, and Z are real. That's N of R. You take gamma as N of Z. You take your space X to be, uh, it should be N R over ga N gamma. And you the, the dynamics is just to translate by element in this, has, in this null group, in this uh, null potent group. You take a continuous function on the, on the manifold and you get a sequence. And they show, it's not that difficult, they generalize Vinogradov's methods, but it's very nice. They show that mu is disjoint from any null sequence. So any null sequence is any sequence that's realized in a null manifold. That's a critical part. That's paper three and four of this series critical part in their argument, and that's the analog of the Vinogradov part, and it's got a beautiful application eventually to systems of linear equations. All right, uh, there are other known cases, Rivat, which have to do with certain very simple sequences called Moore sequences, which if you translate will be uh, expressed in this language too. So, in as a working piece in many proofs about primes, all of these are theorems about primes, this disjointness is at the heart, the disjointness or the proof that Mobius is not realized or it's disjoint in the sense that I've described uh, from a zero entropy, very simple homogeneous system is critical. But all these dynamics, all these zero entropy dynamics that I've told you about here are extremely simple dynamics. They're not mixing, they're what are called uh, distal. And this is what, when uh, Green was giving some lectures about four years ago on this at the Institute, uh, we had, I kept on asking him, he was writing G mod gamma all the time where G was a null potent group. <laughs> and I said, you write G mod gamma and then he was saying he's using Ratner and he was using Ratner in a null potent group, that's not due to Ratner, that was known long before, it's much easier. 
So I said, what's the story in a semi-simple group? That's where the dynamics are much more complicated. And then quickly it became clear that this, con uh, I should have mentioned that very from the beginning. If the dynamical system is positive entropy, then it's no longer true that you disjoint. So anything that I've seen, it's not if and only if. I, I'm not claiming that every system of positive <laughs> entropy is necessary. You might be able to construct some system, I don't know. But if you take a, a, a G mod gamma and it's got positive entropy, then I can use uh, standard Markov partitions to construct a point inside the space which correlates for which the orbit and ob uh, the, for which the observed sequence will correlate with me. So the zero entropy is morally if and only if. So to measure this conjecture, one really wants to prove this theorem where the dynamics are not just uh, zero entropy like these simple ones that have the null manifold case, but one where the actual dynamics is mixing. And the big step there, something that's mixing, that's zero entropy, is unipotent flows in semi-simple groups. Those are all zero entropy, and those are much more complicated sequences. And so one of the aims that I've had for a while, and that's now at least been achieved in the simplest case, is that mu is disjoint from the horocycle flow. So that's the th main theorem that's new here. It's the theorem of Bergen, Ziegler, and myself. Yeah, you can find it on the archive. And I will say a word about the proof in a minute. But that's the first. The more complicated the system, the more you've learned about Mobius, the disjointness. The dream is to build up enough systems there eventually to prove something very striking here. And you'll see, had I got rates here, I would be able to do much more. So it is precisely... It was very important throughout that the notion is just little o of n because this proof depends on Ratner heavily. It's ineffective and I have no rate. I will say a word about that. Or what kind of uh, application does it have to the solution you find? I will say at the end. Uh, but unfortunately it doesn't because I don't have a rate. So that's the philosophical side of this. I'm trying to, this, this, this lecture is about trying to firstly formulate what the Mobius randomness principle is point out to you that everything we're doing has always been proving that we disjoint from more and more complicated systems. And eventually, if the full conjecture is true, then with the rate, then you would get twin prime. So, I mean, I think this is the right way to think about the problem. Okay, now I, I did something which I <laughs> resisted for a long time. I haven't given you a proof that mu is Mobius. And the proof comes by thinking in this tautological way, which is not my style at all but I couldn't resist defining a dynamical system out of Mobius itself. Because I wanted to first just explain that this disjointness conjecture actually fits into the pure theory of dynamics. I wanted to say two dynamical systems are disjoint, not just by Mobius, I haven't defined it. So the, let's do something which looks purely tautological. All right, it's, it's not a bad thing to do, it's just you're gonna tell me what can I say about this. So I'm going to define a system it's, I'm going to call it the Mobius flow. So I look at the numbers minus 1, 0, and 1 to the n. So that's in my topological space. I take the Mobius sequence itself, about which I'm telling you we know a few things now. It's, we know it's linear disjointness from a few comp reasonably complicated zero entropy systems. And, of course, the, I do what I did at the beginning. I take the sequence, I close it up in that space, and that's going to be the definition of the Mobius flow. You should be shouting, I don't know who, who's in the closure. <laughs> that's begging the question, right? Anyway, that's a system. That's a compact topological system. And it's the smallest system in the world which contains Mobius. If, Mo if Mobius is realized anywhere, it'll contain the system inside there. That's clear. So this is the simplest system in which Mobius is realized. Is that some kind of property of Is it what? Uh, I think uh, if you have any other system in which you can realize it, you can realize the uh, sort of names, the words that you get already. But can there be a map of the system? I don't know about a continuous map. So I, I would just, uh, I'll make the conclusion from it. I'm going to, so if you realize, so the following is true. If you realize Mobius in any system and the entropy of that system is zero, that will if this system has positive entropy, which I'm going to prove for you, that system has positive entropy. So I can at least make that conclusion. That's my proof that Mobius 
is random is, is not uh, deterministic. Okay, so this is sort of a basic system, and I know very little about it. However, like with groups that are very complicated, and this again is very much Furstenberg's point of view. If you have a dynamical system, you don't know much about it, you might look for factors of that system which you do know something about. And if a factor of the system is already complicated, then it has to be at least that complicated. So I'm going to show you a system which we will be able to study using the sieve. And that's a system that's got a lot of beef to it. And it's, the Mobius flow is at least as complicated. And it's an interesting system. So instead of looking at minus 1, 0, and 1, let's square the numbers. So let's cheat. Let's really look at uh, minus 1 and 1 and identify them. And let's look at what's happening between 0 and 1. Because Mobius takes three values. So I look at the square-free sequence, mu 1 squared, mu 2 squared. So those are the numbers which are square-free. And it's now living in 0, 1 to the n. I take its closure, which again, you don't know what it is. I'll tell you what it is in a second. And this is, I call the square-free flow. And it's obvious that the square-free flow is a factor of the Mobius flow, meaning uh, the Mobius flow, that was this transformation shift to the left. If you just project, if you just square each coordinate, this is a continuous map from the Mobius flow to the square-free flow, and this diagram commutes. So if you go this way and there, that's what a factor means, and that's a continuous map. So the square-free flow is a factor of the Mobius flow. Now, the miracle is the square-free flow is something we can say something about. And I'm going to tell you there's now recent good progress on this. So firstly, what's the closure in the square-free flow? Which numbers are in the closure of that square-free sequence? And the answer is given. The, the reason you can do this is because the square-free sieve is much better understood than the ordinary sieve. You can sieve much more in the setting of the square-free sieve, and that's what we do. That's what the proof uses. No, nothing new in the sieve, just more the uh, fact that you're executing it in, a, in an exotic situation. So I'll say a subset of the integers is, ad, is admissible if when you reduce it mod p squared, so this is any subset of the integers. I'll say it's admissible if when I reduce mod p squared for every prime p, I don't get all the residue classes mod p squared. So the square-free sequence has that property. <laughs> but they are <coughs> okay, so you don't get every, all the complete residue classes mod p squared. So, now I can tell you from using the square-free sieve, one can show that the square-free flow, its closure, the set of points in, the set of sequences of zeros and ones which is in the closure of that orbit, consists exactly of all the points y whose support is, uh, so uh, if you have a sequence y, it's a sequence of zeros and ones, its support is where it's 1. As long as this place is where it's 1 is admissible, then that sequence is in the closure. So that means I now know many points in the closure, and then I can try to compute its entropy by seeing the exponential growth rate of the number of points. And indeed, it's very easy to compute the entropy of this square-free flow, the topological entropy at 6 over pi squared times log 2. And then you can prove from that some elementary properties of the square-free flow, which is a topological dynamical system. The most important thing that you should remember is it's got positive entropy. It's proximal. A very interesting thing is it doesn't have a factor. So the square-free flow I'm going to tell you more about in a second. This is the basic properties of the square-free flow. It wants to have a factor which itself is just a rotation of a, of a compact abelian group. So throughout with square-free numbers, as you can imagine, this infinite product group, the product of these finite groups, z mod p squared z, with a transformation. So this is called the Kronecker flow. You take x to x. The one here is the gen generator of the group in each coordinate. That's an ergodic Kronecker flow. This specific thing wants to be a factor of the square-free flow, but it isn't. And in fact, in uh, Firstenberg's th paper on what are called the theory of joinings and the theory of disjointness, he asks the question whether if something uh, is not a, f whether the, he has two notions of disjointness. One where you have a joining of two systems, then they, a non-trivial joining, then they are dis not disjoint. Or is that equivalent to not having a common factor, like in the theory of primes of groups, abelian groups? And, and he says they don't look the same, and he chooses the better definition, which is the theory of joinings. This system is sufficiently complicated that's a, a, an example 
of a system which doesn't have a common factor, but it is uh, got a joining. So it wants to have this as a factor, but it, for topological reasons, can't have this as a factor. But keep this in mind. And the system's not weak mixing. That's a technical thing. So there's this thing that once you identify the closure using the sieve, it's quite easy to understand these properties of the square free flow. There's been a lot of progress on the square free flow. Firstly, at the measure level. So there are two natural invariant measures, and I want to mention this to you because it shows you that this is a rather interesting dynamical system, the square free flow. So square free flow is this topological system, which is a fact of the Mobius flow, which I know very little about, except conjecturally. Uh, this this uh, system has many invariant measures, and I want to point out two of them. The first is the measure which is important because it will have something to do with the square free sequence. So let me define for you a measure on, on this uh, 0, 1 to the integers, or uh, the measure is going to be supported on, on the closure that I gave you. So it's supported on S. And it's defined as follows. For cylinder sets, that's sets where these are sequences where at, for finite, uh, you take a finite set A and the support Y of A is 1 for, for sequences for which Y of A is 1 for A in A, I define the following quantity. The new measure of A, this is this measure new, is a product of all primes of 1 minus the number, of, this comes from the surf as you can imagine, 1 minus the number of T A bar P squared is the number of uh, uh, numbers that you get when you reduce modulo P squared, the set A. Okay, so that's some number between zero, 1 and P squared. It will never be P squared if A is admissible. That was the definition. Finite subset of natural numbers. Yes, this is a finite subset. So this ratio here, if A is admissible, will be n never 1, will never be P squared. And so this, and this product oh, converges, it's easy to see. So this gives you a number. And this gives a measure on cylinder sets, and then build, you build it up to a measure on the sigma algebra. And that gives you a, and it's invariant under the shift. And this measure is very important for us because if I use it to define a measure system, a pr process I was calling it, then the square free numbers, which is a, a sequence in the space, is actually equidistributed relative to this measure. So we're in this topological space. We now have a measure and a sequence is equidistributed. You know what that means. So th that's the importance of this measure. It's the point that we're interested in is generic for this measure. And then I was able to show the system is ergodic. That was quite difficult. And it's got zero entropy. So the measure of entropy of the system, so it is deterministic. So the square free process with this measure is deterministic. And I was even able to show that it has a factor, which is that chronic of flow. Recently, Sinai and Celerossi showed something rather interesting. They computed the full spectrum of this flow, after which it became clear that this factor map is actually an isomorphism. So measure theoretically the square free flow with that measure is nothing more than a chronic <coughs> flow. It's a theorem of Celerossi uh, Cel uh, and Sinai. But the most interesting thing at the measure level is uh, a student of mine, Pechner, who's just in his second year. He's been able to identify, show that there's a unique measure of maximal entropy for the system. Remember that the topological entropy is was defined purely topologically, but it's a theorem that the topological entropy is the supremum of all the measure entropies over all invariant measures. But that doesn't mean there's a unique one there. It also doesn't mean it's attained, but it happens to be attained in the system. And that, uh, measure that unique measure of maximal entropy he identifies, and he uses uh, Ornstein's theory. This is quite serious uh, ergodic theory to actually identify that relative, this process with that measure so the square free flow with the measure of the unique measure of maximal entropy is actually isomorphic to a Bernoulli process with the same entropy, of course, times a the, the ever-present chronic of flow. So this is a truly uh, nice fact about the square free flow. So getting back to where we are, we have this chronic of flow, uh, we have this Mo Mobius flow, which I'm trying to understand. It has a factor which we understand very well because we can do square free sieving. And from that, we learned that 
the, uh, Mobius is random. But I'm cheating. I'm getting the randomness from the zeros and the ones, not from the minus ones and the ones. But Mobius has three values. And so you can't realize Mobius because the square free flow has positive topological entropy and Mobius has just extra entropy. Okay, so that's a proof of that. I will return to what the application might be and things like this right now. But I want to say that uh, if you assume the Charla conjecture, you can write down what you expect the Mobius flow to be exactly and you can write down everything in the language of dynamics and you can show that basically uh, the randomness in Mobius, if you assume Charla, that the Mobius flow is purely random except for a, a zero entropy factor, which is all the time this Kronecker factor, which is called its Pinsker factor. So the upshot of all this is that this is a, actually a very interesting dynamical system if you can show anything about it. So it's a soft fact, I would say, that we're proving that it's random, but I'm much more interested in this disjointness. So the, the deepest things we know about Mobius are that it's disjoint about against reasonably complicated systems, and the most complicated system we know is against horocycle flow. Let me say a word about the proof of that, and then I will end with the application that's obvious, that the immediate application of this theory, that if you had rates, you would solve this problem. So Vinogradov's method, I would like to say, is a dynamical method. So what Vinogradov does, it's a brilliant idea. He says, suppose you want to sum mu of n against f of n. Okay, so this is a, the fundamental technique. This is his big insight of bilinear forms. So you want to estimate some mu of n, f of n. And f of n is a bounded sequence. His method, which is based on estimating norms of certain matrices associated with this, is, is tells you that if you can understand the cancellation, so you take uh, f, this should be little f. You suppose you compute the sum n up to n of, so remember our sequence, I'm now, ta sorry, this is an arbitrary sequence, but in our setting, our sequence will be the observable inside down, in a dynamical system. So I want to exploit that. So I'll need to be able to compute sums of this function on progressions with big steps. And there's a level of distribution question here, which is in any serve type argument. And so what you need to do is in order to understand this sum, the first thing you need to do is to be able to understand the sum of f of t to the n d1 times x, which is something you have every right to ask because that's in the dynamical system. These are called Birkhoff sums. But these are not the regular Birkhoff sums because D1 is going to be quite big. It's going to be maybe a small power of N. In the worst, you want to allow it to be big. And you still want to understand what the sum is. And you don't want to understand this for almost all X. That's, that'll, Mobius is dis, joined from almost all sequences is trivial. Now, I shouldn't say that. That's a great theorem of Bergen. <laughs> it's a non-trivial theorem of Bergen. But from the point of view of number theory, it's, it's the randomness is not coming from the Mobius. Erase that from the <laughs> recording. <laughs> Too late, yeah. Yeah, okay. So these are sums, which are Birkhoff sums, and they're called sums of the type, type 1 sums. And those are very naturally associated with your dynamics. And if you want to understand what Vinogradov says, if you want to understand this sum, the first thing you better is understand that. That was always the case. These are the sums that you would get if you ever served. But these bilinear sums are to do the same thing where you're doing a diagonal action. So it's f of n, d1 times n times f of d2 times n, which in our case would be f of t to the d1 times n. Same x, f of t to the d2 times n. And you'll be able to understand, have to understand these sums. Now these are Birkhoff sums also, but not in the system itself, but in the joining of the system with itself. So you're forced to understand the equidistribution or Birkhoff sums in the product and very quantitatively too. So to use any of the standard methods or re, the, the very great versions of Vinogradov's method, especially by Vaughan and then in Ko Ivanich Kowalski, you'll see very beautiful versions of this. They all require rates and they all build to require rates. So the first thing that uh, Ziegler and Bergen and I do is to formulate a Vinogradov method which is free of rates. So we make a finite Vinogradov method. You'll find it in the paper, purely finite version. 
And then you can use that finite version to say that if you understand these just whether this converges to the integral of f or maybe this converges to the integral of f and the product, without knowing rates, you can use this finite version. And now to do horocycle flows, what are these exponential, what are these sums in the horocycle flow case? Well, this sum <coughs> I'm going to return to is a sum that uh, Dani studied very carefully, which is the equidistribution of horocycle uh, of of orbits in horocycle flows in the upper half plane. But the minute I take the joining of a horocycle flow with itself, all effective methods are gone. This is the great theorem of, this is the first case that Ratner did. She did the general case much later, but the first breakthrough was Ratner's work in 83, where she did disjointness or the joinings of two horocycle flows or any number of horocycle flows. And she showed what these limits are. No effective rate in that case, which is why our theorem is not effective. Uh, she handled that also. <laughs> she handles it. So our work, our proof of the disjointness of Mobius from a horocycle flow uses uh, Ratner and hence is ineffective. However, these for type 1 sums still are very informative. So now let me give you the kind of theorem that you might... Okay, so this was just a description of what I just said there. I forgot I had this slide. So let me end with this, which is much even closer to horocycle flows. If we could have proved that theorem with a rate, with some log power rate, we'd be able to solve the following kind of question, which is a problem. I don't know if it's yours or Margulis's, but the question is, suppose you take a horocycle flow. Let's stick to that path plane. You could ask this in any G mod gamma with a unipotent orbit. Now, one of the theorems, this is Dani's theorem, is that in... A horocycle flow. So let's take SL2R of SL2Z. It's good enough. It's, it's the topic of these lectures anyway. <laughs> so let's take our favorite space, SL2R of SL2Z, and we take the transformation by multiplying by 1101. That's a unipotent flow. And Dani's theorem is that if you take a point in the space and you look at the orbit of this point, it's either periodic or its closure is a circle or its closure is the whole space and it's equidistributed re relative to our measure. It's the first case of Ratner's theorem. I mean, if you compact quotient, it's simpler. That's a theorem of Furstenberg. This already is extremely complicated because it's got these three kinds of behaviors. And Dani proved that. So we know what the, orbit, what the orbit looks like on integers. And the question was raised, what does the orbit look like if you go at prime times? Suppose I look at a horocycle flow, because that's very close to all this. So I'm moving on this horocycle orbit. I start at a point X in, in the space here. And I go at times which are primes. Am I equidistributed? And the conjecture is you're still equidistributed in the same orbit that the integers were equidistributed. In other words, the primes are as ran. This horocycle flow can't upset the equidistribution because of this disjointness. That's exactly what it is. So if you got rates in our previous theorem, you would prove this. Unfortunately, we don't have rates. And in fact, in Dani's theorem, nobody has rates either. So Ubus and I have been able to get rates on the type 1 sum. So there were type 1 sums and type 2 sums. The type 2 sum is really the product. The joining is already uses the full force of Ratner's ideas. But on the dynamics just of horocycle the flow itself, with these steps is a very delicate business. And using the best bounds towards Ramanujan, we can... Uh, um, oh, there's a lie here. I had to assume Ramanujan. The best bounds which I gave you in the second lecture were not... I said, this was... I, I prepared for that. I said to you in that lecture, the 7 over 64 is good enough for anything and should replace Ramanujan in any application. It's not good enough for this application. <laughs> so this is assuming Ramanujan. Sorry. Maybe it's slightly sharper than the 7 Yeah, 112. 112. So you don't, you don't yeah, that's because we're doing it. Uh, we're fa facing a limit of a seven. You have to get to the point where the, the, uh, the production of primes in a bilinear method. So we can't produce primes uh, unconditionally. Okay. So here's, here's the theorem. Uh, 
we would, if we were able to handle Ratna <coughs> effectively, get the following theorem that the values at prime times are equidistributed. What we're getting is that for, um, I take that back, this theorem, I'm, I'm a bit jet lagged. This theorem is unconditional. <coughs> it's a finer theorem where, where Ramanujan enters. This uses Ramanujan, uh, uses the bounds we have. So the theorem is the values at prime should be equidistributed if we are on a generic point. So suppo suppose we start at a point which is not periodic. If it's periodic, we know what's happening. If the closure of the orbit's a circle, we also know what's happening by Vinogradov's work. So the third case is suppose we're in a generic orbit. By Dani, there's, there's just three place, cases. In that case, the orbit on the integers is equidistributed and dense, and we want to prove that the orbit at the primes is dense. We can't prove that because we don't know how to handle the type 2 sums, but by effective treatment of the type 1 sums, we can prove this version. That if the set has got volume bigger than 9 tenths, and that do, does use the best bounds that we have, then you will enter that set. Any set whose volume is at least 9 tenths, you will hit, enter it at prime times infinitely often. That's maybe an example of what we can prove. And if you take the orbit at numbers which have at most prime factors, it is dense. So it's a slight weakening of the condition. So instead of taking it at orbit at prime times, you take it at numbers which have at most prime, 100 prime factors, fixed number of primes, you are dense. And that is using these bounds towards Ramanujan. But perhaps the most important thing that we have to do there is we effectivize uh, Dani's theorem in this case. We give an effective version of Dani's theorem, meaning I would have to explain what that means. It's rather hard to effectivize. We effectivize it using harmonic analysis and ideas from automorphic forms, and in particular, as always, bounds towards the Ramanujan conjecture. Thanks. If anybody's interested, there are many papers on that. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So just a little, I won't give you anything. Do you, I know. Do your um, results predict what kind of error terms we should No. So, yes, in this last part, yes. So against horocycle flows, on, we know what's supposed to happen. It's just we can't make effect of the Ratna in, in the joinings. So the bilinear sum, which is a joining sum, uh, we have to use, we only know ineffectively. But in the type 1 sums, the level of distribution that we can, Ramanujan gives you a level of distribution one half for the type 1 sums, which is the best you can ever hope to get, just like one when you, use, you know what I'm talking about. So you get the sort of, like Riemann would give you, and Bombieri Vinogradov often gives you, uh, when you're summing on primes and serving a uh, level of distribution one half. So we get a level of distribution one half for the one type one sums. Um, beyond that, uh, I, I'm not sure. For the type two sums? Yeah, the type two sums we, we can't control and rat, nobody's ever made rat. Uh, one of the most important problems is to make rat effective. Just in the product of two upper half planes. It's, the, it's got all the beef there. And that would open the door for us. But we engineered the problem so as to use Ratna in an ineffective way. Um, my belief is that... Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I think the extension to all unipotent flows and using general version of Ratna should not be too difficult. It hasn't been done. Uh, so then you would have now the disjointness of Mobius from all zero entropy homogene linear homogeneous dynamics. And you can even do aut automorphisms of that. So, if that. so the conjecture will be proved before long, I think, for all homogeneous dynamics. Um, I think effective versions of that are getting very close to proving twin prime. Yeah. By the way, uh, to show that Mobius has any more entropy than coming from the square free factor seems very hard. But of course the conjecture, if it's true, would imply that, because if Mobius has no more, uh, imagine that I've got rather the square free factor, then, I, then I'm telling you I don't know that, so if you took the function lambda instead of mu, then there's no factor there. Lambda is just minus one to the number of prime factors, not, not the square free business. Then nobody can show that that's random in any sense. This is extremely hard. But then the conjecture would be that's disjoint against any zero entropy system. 
And that would imply that it has got positive entropy because if it, if it, uh, if it had zero entropy, then it's just joint against itself, which of course it can't be. So it is the right language to capture the Mobius randomness. Yeah. Not in, uh, in the form that I'm stating it. If you put in a rate, so uh, the disjointness conjecture with a rate, so let me not say that. Charla with a rate certainly implies twin prime. Disjointness with a rate, I think, will imply twin prime. I haven't actually got a formal proof, but it's close. But without a rate, it certainly doesn't. But the disjointness is very close to understanding things like twin prime. Yeah. Have any of these things been based upon any of those? No. No, no. Uh, so uh, he's, he's asking, will that give you primes of the form n squared plus 1? So uh, I think th uh, what I, uh, I... I don't know. The point is you'd have to invent a clever dynamical system which captures that and then apply the disjointness conjecture against that to learn information. So uh, we don't have that many dynamical systems that are useful. So far, I've only looked at homogeneous systems which don't pick that up. So I, I, I don't understand the implications. I don't have the knockout implication. Yes, the d I would love to be able to say yes, the disjointness conjecture implies twin prime, formally, in the way but that, I think, but the set of ideas, I think, does. Yeah. So this uh, random walk that you have a yeah. time, you Mobius, Mobius, right. And you wrote down a certain uh, formula of uh, summation of mu n up to capital N. Yes, is n to the half plus epsilon, right. right. Exactly. Yeah. So now you can imagine uh, the very complicated random box you know in physics actually. Yeah, yeah, it's non self intersecting and things like that, yeah. So, so now, uh, would there be an, an uh, I, I don't think. So notice that, that there are two directions that you can take with Mobius. One is a direction with how much cancellation is there just in sum of mu of n against a simple function like 1 or a well-behaved function. That is very much saying that Mobius is random at some level, and it's very much connected to the Riemann hypothesis. It is the Riemann hypothesis. If you put a character there, it's a Riemann hypothesis for some other L function. Put a coefficient of a modular form there, it's a Riemann hypothesis for another L function. So it's very much connected to that. Uh, and that's got to do with this rate. And it's not, you can't model that much further. In other words, the random walk would be, there would be a law of large, lum, large numbers that it's what gets it big as square, log, log or something. I can't remember. That's not true here. There is structure at, this, at the level of n to the half because the Riemann zeta function has zeros. And they control, there's an almost periodicity behavior for that at, the, at that level. So the whole analogy breaks down at n to the half. And that's what, so anything you start to look at that level, it's not going to be a good model. But there's the second thing that I'm pointing out, which is what's the, what's the local randomness in Mobius, not big, but mu of n, mu of n plus 1, or mu of n times xi of n, what's happening locally, and where I don't ask for much cancellation. I don't even know what to conjecture is the correct order of cancellation. I, I'm not even going to suggest something like that, because that seems dangerous. And this is a, a much cruder thing but it's capturing a much deeper part of Mobius, actually, in my opinion. It's capturing the, random, the true randomness in the Mobius function. I mean, the sequence minus 1 to the n cancels handsomely. Too much, in fact. <laughs> so Mobius doesn't cancel beyond square root. So it's, it's, there have been papers of people who related it to Brownian motion, by the way. Yeah. There, 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 there are papers like that. Yeah, yeah. So there, there are some papers which are relating Riemann to, if you study this remainder and renormalize things. The real uh, uh, statistical physics thing which captures that are the zeros of zeta, which is modeled by random matrix theory, was always made for it. It's like made like a glove. But that's got nothing to do with mu of n, mu of n plus 1, or mu of n times xi of n, which is, they're really different directions.